So here in 13.2, chapter 13.2, we're going to take a look at the physical methods to control microorganisms. Um, in chapter 13.3, then we're going to look at the chemical methods, because remember we said that there are two different ways to go about this. We can do it physically, and then we can do it chemically, or we can do it both. Um, so we're going to take a look at the physical methods. The first physical method is heat. Uh, so in this case, when we're talking about heat and we apply heat, what it does is it alters the membranes and it denatures the proteins, right? So if we get proteins really, really, really hot, um, those bonds that they have between them, so namely those hydrogen bonds within the different uh, amino acid side chains are going to start to fall apart. Those bonds are going to fall apart, break apart, and then even so much to where the peptide bonds between the amino acids will fall apart as well. So firstly, though, it's going to denature those proteins, make them fall apart. And if we're denaturing proteins, then we're denaturing enzymes. And if we're denaturing enzymes, uh, then we're killing the organism because it can't live without enzymes. Also altering the membranes. So when we alter the membranes, oftentimes then we're lysing the cell because if we're altering the membrane and poking holes or, or melting it, um, then we're going to be killing the organism as well. So we have a couple different terms here. We have our thermal death point, or TDP. This is our lowest temperature at which all microbes are killed in a 10-minute exposure. So if we expose something um, to bacteria, or if we expose bacteria to something for 10 minutes, to some sort of physical method for 10 minutes, um, then all the microbes are dead. So within our 10 minute window, all the microbes are dead. This is our lowest temperature. So for example, if we're talking about heat, right? If we're talking about heat, we can say if we put something at a particular temperature, that lowest temperature, the, as low as we can get it um, and kill everything in 10 minutes is our thermal death point. Now, we then also have our thermal death time. So our our number um, or our units for a thermal death point are going to be in temperature, right? So whether it's degrees C or degrees Fahrenheit or degree, or not degree, but in Kelvin, uh, what we're talking about is temperature. So our thermal death point is going to be our lowest temperature where we kill everything in 10 minutes. Our thermal death time is going to be the length of time that's needed to kill all microbes in a sample at a given temperature. So up here, the input is our time, which is 10 minutes. Down here, our input is the temperature. So we say at this particular temperature, it takes a certain amount of time. That's our thermal death time, our TDT. We have two different types of heat uh, to control microbes. We have dry heat and we have moist heat. So for dry heat, this is what we're utilizing in our laboratory most often. Anytime we're, you know, plating anything or moving bacteria, culturing different things, we're using an open flame. So using a Bunsen burner like the image down here or using an incinerator, which is the one on the right here. So they do the same thing. Uh, the Bunsen burner here is where we are going to uh, sterilize our inoculating loop. And then on the right, in an incinerator, you do the same thing, except you put the inoculating loop in here, and it's even though it's not a flame, it's actually incredibly hot. It's kind of like a heater uh, or a toaster. So hot that it kills everything. We also have heat sterilization in an oven, right? So in an oven, it's not moist heat, but it is heat. Um, so we can crank up an oven up to you know 700 degrees, and it's going to kill many, many bacteria in there. So we have dry heat sterilization. This would be over a long period of time, though, versus an open flame. We know it doesn't take that long. Then we have moist heat sterilization. Moist heat sterilization is actually more effective than dry heat sterilization. And that's why we use our moist heat sterilization for um, making sure that our media is sterile, making sure that our glassware is sterile, um, all of these things that are going to be used in the laboratory, particularly for us. But even if we think about in medical facilities or in research laboratories, they need to make sure that things are uh, sterile and it's more effective for moist heat sterilization or with moist heat sterilization. And that's why we utilize an autoclave for that.
it just penetrates the cell better. It's a liquid environment. Um, so the liquid heat is going to, or the, the moist heat is going to penetrate better. So let's talk about the autoclave for a moment. You guys know that we have an autoclave in our laboratory. Uh, the autoclave was designed in 1879. Again, it's the most effective way to sterilize something or some things. It utilizes moist heat, and that's because we add the water, we pour in the water, and then we get that water above the boiling point of water. Um, so 121 or 132 degrees C. Then what we do is we also apply high amounts of pressure, so 15 to 20 PSI. So we remove the air from the autoclave, we fill it with steam, and then we, we apply high pressure. The length of exposure is going to vary, but typically when people autoclave things, they do it for at least 20 minutes. Uh, though it does depend, it depends on things like volume, the nature of the material being sanitized. So, for example, if we are going to be sterilizing something just like glassware, empty, clean glassware, and we're sterilizing it, that might not take as long as something like in a giant container of media that we're trying to sterilize. It might take longer for it to penetrate through thick, thick layers of media than it would just to make sure that it's getting rid of anything on the surface of glassware. Then we have something that are called, or some things that are called retorts. And a retort is just a large industrial autoclave. So something like this here is a retort. We have in class something like this, where we have this kind of small canister. Uh, we place our items inside the canister. We close the lid very tightly, and then we set it to go. So we have a pressure regulator that's going to release the pressure when it's done. Uh, and then we have pressure sensors so that we know what the pressure is inside as well as the temperature inside. And then we have timers to let us know when to get the stuff out. On the right-hand side, this is an example of a large industrial autoclave. So you can see that it's all uh, very fancy um, pressing buttons and it's going to go through the process of autoclaving. So when we put something into an autoclave, say for the laboratory, or let's say for surgical instruments for um, a surgical setting, how do we know that everything was killed on it? How do we know that it even worked, right? So we, we stick it in this machine. Uh, we tell the machine to boil the water, go above the boiling point, and to increase the pressure, which includes just removing the air and filling it with steam, which creates that high pressure. Um, and then we expose it for a certain amount of time. Well, we can do this utilizing um, different techniques. One, we can use a recorder. So a recorder is a device that actually tracks the activity inside. And so that retort that we saw a moment ago, that big industrial one, likely they have a printout of exactly the temperature and of exactly the pressure at each moment um, inside of that autoclave. And this is important for things like surgical instruments, right? We want to have a... a a readout that says, yes, it was at this level for this amount of time. Um, it was at this temperature. It was at this pressure because we want to make sure those things don't have anything on them. Uh, otherwise, in research laboratories, um, in lower level laboratories, we can just use things called internal indicators. Uh, these are things that are autoclaved with the materials. You can see on the right hand side, this right here is our autoclave tape. When you put autoclave tape on, normally it looks like this, all white. Once it has been autoclaved, there's a chemical reaction that occurs within the tape. There are these stripes on here. Once it's been autoclaved, it's going to look like this on the right. And that's because it's been autoclaved, and you can kind of see it maybe if you look really closely right here, there are actually white stripes on there, and the chemical reaction occurs within the stripes, and then it turns black when that particular temperature is reached. We could also do something called a spore test, and the autoclave tape is something that's most widely used. And, you know, you stick a piece of tape on something in there, and then you know that it's been autoclaved and everything's sterile. Uh, what can also be used, however, is the spore test. So either adding a paper or a liquid suspension of serothermophilus spores, and then that's incubated after autoclaving. So this is more of a long-term plan. So if you can take a container or a piece of paper with our serothermophilus 
spores on it and then put it into the autoclave, run the autoclave. At this point, we want to know if the autoclave did go through the process, if it did sterilize things. Then we can take that paper or we can take that liquid suspension and see if anything grows. Because if anything grows, if we're giving it nutrients, these serothermophilus spores, if we're giving it nutrients and if it grows, then that means that it did not effectively kill endospores. It did not effectively sterilize, and therefore it's all of the items that were sterilized with it are not to be trusted. Lastly, we have a DIAC tube. <clears throat> and this is a, a glass ampule or a glass tube, kind of uh, blown glass tube, that contains temperature-sensitive pellets. And these pellets actually melt at the correct temperature. Um, so they will only melt at that temperature. So once you get up to that temperature um, in the autoclave, you know, and then everything goes down and the pressure is relieved and you open it up and you take things out, you will see that these beads melted, these little pellets melted. And then you know that the autoclave got up to the correct temperature uh, and then is down now because you're accessing it. Otherwise, um, or typically autoclaves make it so you can't open them up or access them while they're running uh, for safety purposes. So um, at the end, however, when you can't open it up, you can look at either the DIAC tube um, or the autoclave tape immediately and know whether it got to temperature. The spore test is going to take some time because you have to incubate the organism or what you think might be the org organism um, to make sure that nothing was contaminated, and you won't know that for another day or two. Another physical method is pasteurization. In pasteurization, they form a microbial control for food uh, that uses heat and maintains the qualities of the food. And the reason this is important is because if we think about something like the autoclave or the Bunsen burner, if we took our food and we applied it to the Bunsen burner, of course it would just burn it, right? And it wouldn't taste the same. We can't just put something in a fire and then say, okay, if we, we put it in the fire enough, it's going to be, um, all, it'll kill all the microorganisms and we can put it on the shelf and sell it. Same thing with the autoclave. We apply pressure and we apply moisture and it's just going to destroy either the food itself or the flavor of the food. So we had to come up with something different for food items. So pasteurization is not sterilization. Uh, what it does is it does kill pathogens, but it reduces the number of spoilage-causing microbes. So it's specific to spoilage-causing co microbes. They're susceptible to this type of um, chemical or physical method. So again, it's not sterile. Um, things that are pasteurized will eventually spoil. And we, and we kind of already know that when we talk about our milk or when we think about our milk. So, for example, our milk that we find in the refrigerated section in the container, our typical milk containers, they are HTST pasteurized. Um, so, and we'll talk about this in the next slide. And we know that milk does still go bad, right? We know it goes bad over time, and that's because of our spoilage-causing microbes that are within the milk. Um, so they're still in there. We've just reduced the number, and we do that through pasteurization. It is commonly used to kill heat-sensitive pathogens. Um, so again, we, we use this method, and it was designed because we know that these spoilage-causing microbes are heat-sensitive. So heat-sensitive pathogens typically in milk and then in other food products, so like juices and things. When we talk about the differences um, between the milk that can be on the refrigerator shelf and the milk that can sit out on a shelf not refrigerated, what we're talking about is the difference between the HTST and the UHT. So HTST is, stands for High Temperature Short Time Pasteurization, as its name implies, the milk is exposed to a high temperature, so 72 degrees C, for a short amount of time, 15 seconds, and then this is meant to lower the bacterial numbers. Again, there's still bacteria in milk, still um, organisms in milk that can cause disease, meaning it can cause upset and vomiting and diarrhea and things like that. Um, so what we've done is we've decreased the numbers of those microbes by utilizing HTST. So 72 degrees C for 15 seconds. The other type of milk that can sit on the shelf and not get bad is our UHT, which is ultra high temperature. So in UHT pasteurization, this is when we expose milk to really high temperatures, uh, 138 degrees C 
for two or more seconds. So in this case, we're talking about ultra high temperature. If we kept it in there for more um, than say like five seconds or so, it's really going to start to break down and destroy things. But this allows us to have things like milk that can be stored in sealed containers for a really long time without having to be refrigerated. And other things like this. So juices that we can put in a container that's not going to spoil. Um, and other items that we typically think of as needing refrigeration um, can go through the UHT and then can sit on the shelf. So speaking of refrigeration, we all kind of just generally know that refrigeration is going to help keep our food um, longer. <clears throat> and we know this, um, even if we don't know this more specifically in the fact that we think of refrigeration as a type of physical method to control microorganisms. So refrigeration, whether we're talking about at home or in the laboratory, is going to be zero to seven degrees C. And this is going to slow microbial growth um, with our psychrophiles exception. Um, however, most food spoilage organisms are not psychrophiles. And so putting something in the refrigerator is going to slow down their microbial growth. It preserves foods, medical supplies, or lab cultures. So we put these things, um, for example, in our lab, after they've gone through their incubation time, the 24 to 48 hours, we put them in the refrigerator and it halts growth. It stops their growth. Um, or it slows them, depending on the organism. Additionally, we have freezing, whether at home or in the lab. This is when it's below negative 2 degrees C. Um, so our freezer, if we think about that in our house, this can stop microbial growth. And it can possibly kill some pathogens as well. But it does stop microbial growth. However, bacterial growth can then restart when the food starts thawing. And this is an important piece to keep in mind when we're actually thawing our food. So when we have something that we've made, we put it in the freezer because we want it for long-term storage, and that's how we can kind of think of the difference. We know that if we put something in the refrigerator, it will only last a certain amount of time, so say maybe a week, depending on the item, versus if you put it in the freezer, maybe it'll last a couple of months. And we, we intuitively know this, but this is because it's slowing microbial growth in the refrigerator, but we stop microbial growth or even kill it when it's in the freezer. However, when we then take that food out, we need to thaw it. And there are th only three ways here to thaw things safely. One, to thaw it in the refrigerator. So if you take that frozen item out and you put it in the refrigerator, it may take a day or so to thaw, um, but that is a safe way to do that. And that's because all of these organisms are, excuse me, going to start to be um, animated again or vegetative again, um, or just starting to be metabolic again. And as they do this, they're still going to be in a very cold environment. They'll still be in the refrigerated environment where they have slow growth. Um, and so when we thaw something in the refrigerator, if we put it from the freezer to the refrigerator, it's going to take quite some time for those bacterial numbers to get to where they could cause disease. Another option for thawing something safely is if you put it in cold water, not warm water, not hot water, don't do that, put it in cold water that's changed every 30 minutes. So if you think about um, some, something that you put into the freezer and then you take it out and you want to thaw it and you want to have it you know, ready for dinner that night or something. You need to put it in the sink or in a bowl and then put it in there with cold water and then change that cold water out because it'll get warmer every 30 minutes. And this is, again, um, to keep this microbial growth down. Because if we think about something that's been frozen, right, let's just say we have this big piece of something that is frozen right now. <clears throat> And if we were to put it in warm water, let's say we put it in warm water or we were running warm water over it, um, then this outside portion is going to start to thaw, right? So not only is it going to start to thaw, but if we're putting it in hot water, this is our hot water here, then our hot water is touching the surface of this. And so it's thawing on the outside, but the inside is still very, very much frozen. But as it's thawing the outside, that's going to allow those microorganisms to start growing. And if we're putting it in warm water, that's going to make an even better environment, or even hot water, warm water, that's going to make an even better environment for those organisms to grow in because it'll be nice and warm and happy. And after being frozen for a long time, that's going to be very, very good for those organisms. And they're going to start multiplying like crazy. 
So if you put it in cold water, then you don't have the ability for this outside region to start to get warmed up and thaw while the inside is still frozen. Uh, if it's cold water, then things are going to still thaw. The outside will still be getting warmer than the inside, but the warmer is going to be cold like a refrigerator. So it'll still have slow microbial growth rather than being in warm water, which would make it nice and warm and comfortable like an incubator. And then changing it out every 30 minutes to make sure that it stays cold. The last method is utilizing the microwave. So again, utilizing uh, the microwave is because it is fast, not again, but because it is fast. In this case, we're not running into the problem here of having an outer region thaw faster than an inner region um, and trying to somehow make sure that it doesn't get too warm on the outside, but we're still able to thaw the inside or the middle. Now, this is where we can use a microwave. A microwave is going to go in and it's going to affect all of the cells and it's going to make all of the water heat up in all of the cells even, well, not evenly, evenly, but um, kind of across the frozen piece of whatever it is. So uh, the microwave is not going to have this problem of thawing the outer section first and then making that a nice happy place for organisms to grow. So make sure that you know the three different ways that you can thaw things safely. So in the refrigerator, in cold water, changed every 30 minutes, and in the microwave. We also have something called ultra-low freezing. So we have the refrigerator, we have freezing, and then we have ultra-low freezing. <clears throat> so ultra-low freezing is when we have negative 70 degrees Celsius. This is often used for long-term bacterial cultures. For example, when a research laboratory is utili utilizing a particular organism, say they've made a pure culture of it and they've grown up that pure culture and that's what they're using for their research. They want to make sure that they have some sort of stock culture of this uh, so they can put it into tubes and then they can put it at this ultra low freezing temperature. Uh, also, same thing with medical specimens, right? So if a medical um, specimen is taken out, uh, they're going to put it at this low, ultra-low temperature, so maybe it can be something that's researched later. Ultra-low freezing is done with either dry ice or liquid nitrogen tanks. Um, so we can have, you can see this freezer here. There are actually these panels on top to help decrease the, the loss of cold and to help decrease the incoming warm. And so in this case, we actually have tanks that are going to be attached to this freezer, just like our electricity is attached to the freezers and refrigerators in our home, and it's going to lower the temperature. So it'll lower the temperature lower than negative 196 degrees Celsius, um, but the actual bacteria are the cultures or the medical specimens, whatever they are, they're going to get to about negative 70 degrees Celsius. And then over here on the right-hand side, we can see this is a, a vat of dry ice. And so that's something that can be used also to freeze tissues, for example. Um, it can be placed in the dry ice, and then it freezes everything uh, to such a degree to where microbes are not going to be able to grow. So the next type of physical method to control microbes is pressure. And we've already mentioned this briefly because we have spoken about an autoclave. So heat is part of the autoclave, and then pressure is also part of the autoclave. <clears throat> so a high pressure is going to kill most microorganisms because they are going to go through and their proteins will be denatured. Now the exception to this are the endospores, <clears throat> uh, so keep that in mind. But when we're talking about pressure, if we apply a whole bunch of pressure to something, then it'll start to denature the proteins. And again, if we denature proteins, then we're denaturing enzymes, and then we're killing. So in this case, we're applying 100 to 800 megapascals. Uh, sea level is typically about 0 0.1 megapascals. So if we're talking about 100 to 800 megapascals, this is an incredible amount of pressure. Excuse me. In this case, what we're talking about are hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, for example, uh, also our autoclaves that we've already spoken about. Um, but hyperbaric oxygen therapy is actually used to, to treat infections. Um, so the autoclave, of course, is not used to treat infections. Uh, we've already spoken about the autoclave. But uh, a hyperbaric oxygen therapy is used to treat infections. In this case, what happens is the patient actually breathes in pure oxygen, 
but it is pure oxygen at a higher pressure. So at this one to three um, ATM. And when the patient breathes in this pure oxygen at this high pressure, it actually is going to get into the body and this higher pressure is going to um, cause issues for the organisms. What this does is it enhances the body's immune response. So if we get more oxygen in our body, our body works more effectively, more efficiently. It can form toxic free radicals that then harm anaerobic organisms, for example, like Clostridium perfringens, which is uh, gangrene, or one of the symptoms is gangrene, so that can be a big problem, so people can use hyperbaric oxygen therapy for that. Uh, reduces the secretions of toxins from bacteria, so the Clostridium perfringens, again, with the tissue destruction. The gangrene is something where it starts to decay and starts to kill the tissue, so then we can use something like a hyperbaric oxygen therapy tank um, or just breathe it in, and that will reduce the toxins in, in, or that are being released by bacteria. However, it can cause damage to eyes, the middle ear, and the lungs. So all things that rely on a certain amount of pressure in our bodies. So our eyes rely on a certain amount of pressure to keep them nice and round and have everything go on the back of the uh, eyeball there to the retina and communicate that to our brain. So since our eyes are pressurized, they have a particular pressure in there. Utilizing the hyperbaric oxygen therapy can actually change the pressure of the eyes and make it so that somebody's eyes uh, are not working correctly. Uh, same thing with the middle ear. There's pressure in the middle ear. Our ears function due to that pressure, so that can cause problems. Uh, and then lungs as well. Of course, our lungs um, are functioning due to the pre the pressure changes between the inside of the chest, the thoracic cavity, and the outside, the environment. So the next type of method is desiccation. <clears throat> and desiccation is just drying something out or dehydrating something. So we see this used in food preservation. So for example, um, like jerky, like beef jerky, for example, is it an example of um, drying or dehydration. We also dehydrate things when we are talking about making jams and jellies and things like that. We'll look at that in just a moment. Mm -hmm. So for desiccation, we use it for food preservation oftentimes. That's one of the ways we do that. It may not kill all microbes or endospores. So this is another example where once there is hydration, so once there's water, then they can regrow again. Uh, one of the ways that we can do this, that we can desiccate something, is through evaporation. Mm -hmm. So either dry it by the sun, as in something like sun-dried tomatoes, for example, where the tomato slices are placed out or the, the little tomatoes are placed out and they can be dried by evaporation, so all that water is going to be released into the environment. This can be either by the sun, sun-dried tomatoes, or some sort of low heat. Um, so oftentimes when vegetables are dried, like say vegetable chips, they're dried in an oven at low heat. Then we also have lyophilization. <clears throat> lyophilization is rapidly frozen. We call it freeze-dried food. So the food is placed in a vacuum and then brought down to an incredibly low temperature. So the water is then lost through sublimation. And sublimation means that it goes from the liquid, or rather the solid state, directly to the gas state. So it doesn't actually turn into a liquid along the way. So we bring it down to this um, incredibly low temperature. And then once it's at this incredibly low temperature, it's placed in a vacuum. Once it's placed in that vacuum, then that frozen water is going to go from solid, frozen, to a gas. <clears throat> and then we have our freeze-dried food. Uh, so our low temperature and desiccation is very effective. So we, you know, again, low temperature, meaning we're freezing it, and then we have desiccation, um, is going to be very helpful for getting rid of microbes. So some other um, methods or techniques that we use in regards to desiccation are we utilize salts or sugars at very high concentrations. <clears throat> and we do this because this is going to remove the water from the cells through osmosis. So if we take something like uh, this fish down here and completely cover it in salt, uh, it's an example of a salted meat or salted fish. Um, if we completely cover it in salt, then what happens is it's going to affect those bacterial cells, if there are bacterial cells, um, because 
through osmosis, our water, as you can see in this image on the left, bottom left, if this is our cell, um, and then what we do is we put a lot of solute molecules out in, in the environment, then the water is going to be leaving the cell to go and dilute all of those solute molecules, for example, salt. When it does this, then this cell is going to crenate and then it will die. So it loses all of that water out to the exterior. Mm -hmm. So the water is removed from the cells via osmosis because there's a high osmotic pressure because we put so many solutes out there uh, that all of the water is just going to leave the cell and it'll die. Another example is honey. So our salts and sugars, we have our salted meats and salted fish. Um, then we have honey, which is 80% sucrose. So um, honey is highly, highly, highly sugar. And therefore, since we have a high amount of sugar, we have a high amount of solutes. So many solutes that hardly anything can live in there. Our molds and yeasts, however, are more tolerant to high osmotic pressure. So mold and yeast may be able to withstand things for longer. Um, <clears throat> however, if we apply further desiccation to it or over long periods of time, we could get rid of these molds and yeast, depending on the mold and the yeast and the product that we're talking about. The next method is radiation. Uh, so this is everything from high energy radiation to low level, which is sunlight. So let's take a look at the two different types. Uh, there's ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. So we'll start with ionizing radiation. So ionizing radiation includes things like x-rays, gamma rays, and high-energy electron beams. What they do is they can penetrate cells and packaging. Once the, this ionizing radiation, these x-rays or gamma rays, get into the cells and get through the packaging, it's going to alter their molecular structure inside the cells. It, it changes molecular structure of the cells of, in whatever it is we're talking about. It can then break DNA, cause mutations in the DNA, and then when it causes mutations in the, in the DNA, it can lead to cell death. So this is why radiation is so damaging in, to our bodies in general. So we always put those um, big lead... Uh, vests on, for example, when we have x-rays our, of our teeth at the dentist, for example, um, because we don't want those x-rays to get into the rest of our body and start causing DNA damage and start causing cancer because of mutations of DNA. Um, so it's important to not get a lot of exposure to different radiation, particularly ionizing radiation, because it can destroy those cells and lead to cell death and or cancer. Uh, however, when we're talking about food items, that's beneficial because then it can kill other microorganisms. It can kill um, pathogenic bacteria or food spoilage bacteria. So this allows us to sterilize uh, delicate things. So if we think about the sterilization we've already spoken about, it, it was pretty heavy-handed. Um, but when we utilize radiation, then it can penetrate into things and sterilize delicate things or heat-sensitive materials and food in packaging. And for example, in Europe, they actually do gamma ray ionizing radiation to things um, to kill all the organisms. They also do this to tissues for transplantation, uh, different pharmaceuticals, different medical equipment, plastic gloves, P2 dishes, and tubing. Now the other type of radiation is non-ionizing radiation. So this does not affect the molecules or atoms or penetrate packaging. So this is important too because it doesn't penetrate through packaging. It has to be directly exposed to non-ionizing radiation. Our best example of non-ionizing radiation is UV light. Um, UV light meaning light that we're getting from the sun. Our UV light from the sun is causing damage to our DNA. It causes thymine dimers. And then these mutations can cause death, right? We've already spoken about mutations in the class and, and how it can lead to frame shift mutations. And once we have a, a frame shift change, then we're not making the proteins or the enzymes we need. We see the use of UV light or non-ionizing radiation, <clears throat> excuse me, in water purification systems in homes. A lot of times they go through um, UV light. Also, we can see them in ponds and things that have... Um, fountains that sometimes have UV lights hooked up to them. 
Also, we see portable UV lights that are used for camping to try to disinfect things or to try to control things. Maybe I shouldn't say disinfect, but to try to control microbial growth. We have germicidal lamps that are used in surgical settings to apply that non-ionizing radiation. And then we can use this also in our biological cabinets and hoods, and that's something that we can see down here, that they're using a UV light to decrease microbial growth here. Again, however, it does not penetrate plastic or glass, so it has to be exposed directly to the light. Um, this happens when we talk about sunlight, however. So if you want to try to disinfect something, um, sunlight can actually do this very well. I talk about decreased bacterial growth. And I think a lot of people, um, at least a long time ago, really knew this because when you would put your clothes out on the line, it would disinfect them. So people used to use cloth diapers often. Um, some people still do. And those cloth diapers can be washed and then they can be hung up to dry outside. And if they're hung up to dry outside in the direct sunlight, it can kill any bacteria that are growing on it. Um, and the same with all clothes. But if you think about diapers, hanging them up in the sun actually was very beneficial um, to making sure that any bacteria is killed. So again, our UV light can cause thymine dimers. That's what this image is showing down here. Thymine dimers is when the thiamines that are next to each other are going to create a bond and therefore no longer be bonded, hydrogen bonded with their adenines across the way. And so then this can cause problems that we already spoke about. A couple of last <clears throat> methods that we have here. One, sonication. Uh, this is high frequency ultrasound waves. Um, so ultrasounds can actually kill cells. They cause rapid changes in the pressure of the intracellular fluid. So within the cell, it's going to change, uh, it's going to cause rapid changes in the pressure. So low pressure to high pressure back and forth. And what this does then is it can create bubbles inside of the cell, create bubbles. And then these bubbles can disrupt cell structures and oftentimes will cause cell lysis. So we can apply these ultrasound waves to things in order to cause cell lysis. So in, in laboratory settings, laboratories lyse cells on purpose um, so they can utilize these ultrasounds to kill cells on purpose and then get at the contents in the inside. Um, also utilized for cleaning surgical instruments and then lenses, coins, tool, and musical instruments. Um, so just note here that what we're talking about are ultrasound waves. So if we talk about an ultrasound like a, a woman may be getting during a pregnancy, um, then we can consider that these high-frequency ultrasound waves do this in cells. Um, so that means our cells as well, which is why there's a risk associated with utilizing or using ultrasounds during pregnancy. Another method is filtration. Uh, this is where we simply just separate microbes from the sample, so we filter them. Uh, we have different ways that we do that. Um, we can filter our air, filter it through our high-efficiency particulate air filters, so our HEPA filters. Our HEPA filters have a 0.3 micrometer pore size, <clears throat> so this can catch certain things, but not all things, depending on what it is that we are working with. So this image down here is showing you how we have these arranged fibers and how in this case, if it is less than 100 nanometers, then it's going to get caught. It has interception. Um, if it is greater than one micrometer, then it might get caught in here. But if it's less than 0.1 micrometer, then it might get through here. Uh, so our HEPA filters, we have this frame, and then inside the frame, we have a sheet of filters that's folded up. And this is going to catch bacterial cells, endospores, and many viruses. So it's nearly sterile. We do have some viruses smaller than the 0.1 that can get through, but it's nearly sterile. We see these used in cars, airplanes, vacuums, just air purifiers in the home. Uh, so we see the use of HEPA filters pretty regularly. So we have spoken about all of these different ways to control microbial growth. And at the very beginning of the text, we spoke about our BSL levels. Now we're going to talk about our biological safety cabinets or BSCs. 
So we already mentioned, and we kind of already thought about it, especially when we were looking at this image at the beginning of the, uh, of the lecture, that we use HEPA filters um, for air intake or air exhaust or both. So in this case, in the image, we were talking about how the air would be being sucked out of this region so it can go through the HEPA filters before it reaches the exterior, and that happens. Um, but depending on our BSL level, we may have HEPA filters at our air intake so that we don't contaminate something, for example, um, or the air exhaust where it's leaving the room. And that would be an example like in a, a biological safety cabinet here. We have filtration used in hospitals. Uh, we have HEPA, HEPA in rooms and in the entire building. So, of course, for each specific room, we'll have a separate uh, filtration system. And then also throughout the entire hospital, we'll have a filtration system. Now, in our BSC Class 1, this is where we want to protect the environment and our laboratory workers, but these are very low-risk items. So kind of similar to our BSL-1 level items. Um, we have the air that's drawn into the cabinet, and then it's drawn out via the HEPA air exhaust. So that might be an example of what she's working with here, because we can have air that's going in. I'll uh, draw it in a different color here. We have air that's going in, and then that air is going to be leaving. And as it leaves, it's going through the HEPA filters. So it looks like that might be a BSC Class 1. Then in a BSC Class 2, we have directional airflow and partial barrier system. So we may have it to where we have some barriers that prevent that air or any uh, microbacteria or any um, microorganisms from getting into a particular area. So there might be some partial barrier system, um, but we continuously have this directional airflow. So air is being forced into the room and then being forced out of the room, for example. Then we have our BSC class three. Uh, this is when it is gas tight, meaning it is not going to allow something out or in because it is gas tight. Uh, materials enter and exit through a double door system to allow contamination between doors. Uh, so this would be a situation, for example, when a person's in the room and then they need to get their organism or, or whatever it is they're working with, then somebody from the other side of the laboratory would have to assist in getting that to her. And sometimes that means like a mail drop box in the wall, and then that's how they get the item that they're looking for. So here, um, exiting air is passed through two HEPA filters and an incinerator. Um, so incinerator is going to ensure that nothing gets through, um, but the filters should do that as well ahead of time. Uh, personnel use gloves that are sealed to the cabinet. So in BSC class three, um, we don't see something exactly like what we see here on the right, but when we have the cabinet, there are two holes, and these two holes actually have these gloves attached to them. This is actually inside here. Um, so then when a person comes in, they are going to put their hands in the gloves and then utilize whatever, whatever is in here, uh, which they have already set up ahead of time. If we are needing to filter out and sterilize um, a liquid, like say media, for example, uh, versus the air, which is when we use HEPA filters, we can talk about different membrane filters. This is used for liquid samples. They're able to remove bacteria with a pore size of 0.2 micrometers. And remember that bacteria is about one micrometer, um, so smaller than that. And since it has these pores, or larger than that, I'm sorry, since it has larger than the pores. Since the bacteria is larger than the pores, then when we push this filtrate or this sample through, then it's going to catch the bacteria on the side. There are smaller pore sizes for different needs, so we can go all the way down to using pores to catch viruses if that's necessary. So we remove from the laboratory media um, the bacteria, we want to remove it from laboratory media as an example of a use for that. Uh, antibiotic solution, so when they're making antibiotics, they want to make sure that they filtered it multiple times to make sure that there aren't any microorganisms at all in it. Same thing for vitamin solutions, we want to make sure we're not passing along pathogens there. 
uh, vacu vacuum filtration is for larger amounts and syringe filtration for smaller. So you can see over here is syringe filtration. We just have a very small amount here that we want to filter. And then we can see that this is the filter down here. So the person is just going to push down this plunger. The liquid's going to come out on this side and it's going to have gone through the filter to get to the other side. <clears throat> on the left, we can see vacuum filtration. So here we have our machine that's going to create a vacuum and then it's going to pull the solution through this tube and then this is going behind it. Um, but then that will be attached to a container on the other side. And so then all of the bacteria and viruses, viruses can get stuck in the pore or the membrane here. And then the fluid that comes out will be sterilized. So here is, um, well, here are a couple tables from the text, and you should know this information. You don't have to memorize it word for word, but you should understand these different types of physical methods of control. So the boiling with dry heat, um, incineration, utilizing autoclave, pasteurization, etc. So it's split up by using heat and using cold. and using pressure, desiccation, radiation, and then sonication and filtration. And you should be familiar with all these different types of things for each of these.